All right. So let's begin with today's class. And today we are talking about uh, another chapter, and that is the Wasi check and the Gauss plus model. Uh, so again, uh, as I said, these chapters are interconnected, right? And uh, I've created some slides for it. And hopefully that will give us idea about what we are doing and why this Gauss plus model exists, right? Because of the limitations of the Wasicek model that we will just see now. So let's get right into it. Not a very large reading. Uh, expect on the exam, this is a new reading for 2025. So on the exam, expect that you may be asked to calculate the Gauss plus model. How do you calculate the different rates that we have in this particular model? Okay, not a difficult thing to understand. The notations might be a little different, but again, it's very much related to the Wasicek model, which we have seen in the last chapter. So let's get right into it. Uh, why do we do the interest rate modeling is because it is crucial for risk management that we have to, you know, do the risk, uh, the interest rate modeling so that we can adjust our portfolios accordingly. And not only for that, for even pricing the interest rate securities or any derivatives, like for example, you're getting into a swap contract, there's a fixed leg. How do you price those cash flows and get to that fixed leg number, right? So we can use the interest rate modeling. We can predict that and we can find it. So a good model explains the term structure and it is consistent with the implied volatilities, whatever the volatilities that is implied for the short term, for the medium term, for the long term, whatever the volatilities are implied, a good model will actually tell you about all these things. So ideally, in an ideal scenario, what are the objectives of a good model is? Well, it should be consistent with the market prices that we have. And I think this brings the idea of an arbitrage free model, right? I mean, the, your, your model price and the market price, it should match. So if you get that interest rate, that's a good model. That's the objective overall. Market expectation, it should reflect mean reversion. Like your model should not have an explosive kind of a model that, or maybe it goes into the very low interest rate scenario, right? It, it should reflect mean reversion. And of course, the trend that we have in uh, volatility. Usually, you know, if you, when I, when I talk about the volatility trend here and uh, these volatilities, what I mean to say is that Usually what has been observed is that the volatility. So if I have here the short term, here I have the mid term and here I have a longer term. Short term, maybe let's say a day's rate, maybe one day, two day for a very short period of time, maybe a month. Here I can have a two years time period and here I can have probably 30 years of time period. So when I actually look at the historical volatility. How do I find that? I can pick up the, uh, you know, there are two ways. If you remember level one VRM, there were two ways, right? One was the implied volatility, obviously, uh, look at the BSM model and find the implied volatility. And the second one is a historical trend. So here we are referring to the historical trend specifically. If you pull up the data for the last 30 years, and if you plot the volatility, you would realize that the short term volatility, it, it, it picks up a little, okay. It changes, definitely it changes, but it, it does not change as much, but there's a huge amount of uncertainty in the midterm. So the volatility, if you have to say that it picks up at the highest, you know, at, at a very peak level we have for the midterm. Okay. For a two years, what's going to happen? There's an uncertainty, but uh... as you. As you, just a minute here, I'll mute. But as you move across time and that too, when you have a long term uh, point of view, the volatility starts to diminish because 
no one knows what's going to happen 30 years down the line. I mean, that's too far, right? So usually what has been observed, it volatility, it follows a hump shaped, uh, uh, it, it follows that hump shaped structure. So initially it rises for the short term, then it takes a peak for the midterm. And then again, it falls down for the longer term. This, this is the usual trend. And I want you to remember that this is the pattern that happens, that happens in the real world scenario, which is known as a hump shaped volatility. Okay. This is the pattern that we have for the volatility. So a good model should actually reflect a pattern like this. That's what the point here, or that's what the objective of a good model is. Okay. Moving on to the Vasi check model, we look at why this is good or what are the limitations for it. And then we naturally progress to a better model than the Vasi check model. So the Vasi check model, it uses a single factor to model how short term interest rates changes over time. If you look at it, there's only one single factor and that is it takes care of the volatility. There is only one volatility and it assumes that that particular volatility will reflect for uh, the short term, the medium term and the long term as well. And uh, it, it just talks about the short term interest rate. It just tries to predict what's going to happen to only the short term rates. It doesn't try to predict what's going to happen to the midterm rates or the long term. rates. So it is incomplete in itself. Okay. Good for a short term time period. I'm not saying it's bad. Good. However, its main characteristic is mean reversion. So this is the only thing that we have mean reversion where the short term rate tends to revert to its long term average. So it all it boils down to this. If this is my average rate, the entire model, what it does is if it's on the lower side, it will try to pick up and it will revert to its mean level. If it's above the mean, the model will bring a value of interest rates that is going to, you know, it's going to, uh, it's going to predict a downward trend. That's what the entire objective of Vasi check model is. But if you look at it, okay, it has following drawbacks. It fails to replicate complex term structure shapes. So it doesn't tell us about now the shape can be a little humped. It can go up and then fall down and again, pick up. So there, there can be different term structure shapes. It doesn't capture that. And even the real world volatility pattern, which is a hump shape, it doesn't predict that. It fails to account for the observed changes in volatility across maturity. Again, it talks about the short term, the midterm and the, the hump shaped volatility. Same point. It fails to adequately incorporate any macroeconomic trends and monetary policy shifts. So usually I'll talk about this, that why it fails to capture that. And what happens when there is a macroeconomic trends in a, in a, in a particular country or an, an economy. And what happens when there is a monetary policy shifts, it doesn't capture that the other model does. So basically it's a one factor. It just, it just cares about the short term interest rate. That's what you have it here. And there's only mean reversion, nothing more than that. So is it useless? No, it is good. It is good for simple applications like pricing zero coupon bonds. There is no coupons. You do not require multiple interest rates. You probably require one single interest rate. Good to go. And applying basic hedging techniques. If you just want a single rate and if you want to hedge to that rate, it's, it's fair enough. It does the job well for these simple tasks. But there is a better model and we'll talk about the Gauss plus model, but I just want you to understand how the interest rates are actually observed in the market. Okay. So let's try to understand. Let's give some time to it. Okay. Five minutes we spend on this and hopefully you understand that how in real life, the interest rates actually move. 
So how interest rates are observed in the market? How does it actually happen? So we first begin with few things. Okay, there is a question here. How it fails to capture, there is a mean reversion. If it's big, it will quickly revert to its mean value. So understand, understand, uh, we'll, we'll get back to that uh, thing, how it fails to capture these events. And again, it's a model. It's not an accurate model. So I'll, I'll get back to your uh, question, but let's first understand this thing. Hopefully you'll have a better idea as to what is happening here and why we need a better model than the Vasi check model. First, let's try to understand this. So suppose that we have the short term rate. Okay. We call this as a feds funds rate. Now, usually in the U S let's say there are two banks, a and B. So what is a federal funds rate? The central bank of the U S federal reserve, they decide whether they want to increase the rate, decrease the rate. So what is feds fund rate? It is the rate at which these banks borrow from each other. Right. So if the current rate is, let's say 2%. So that means if a wants to borrow, you know, he'll, he has to pay 2% to bank B. And uh, if this bank wants to borrow again, you are, the cost is 2% as simple as that. So this is known as a federal funds rate. Now, if the federal reserve, if they decide that, okay, let's increase the rates by 75 basis points. So what's going to happen at the very natural thing, the very first thing that's going to happen is the short term rates, right? It's going to quickly move up to 2.75. That's very natural. Think about it. Will these banks say that, okay, no, no, we'll, we'll borrow at 2%. No, they will have to obey to the new rates, which is now two basis points or uh, 2% plus. 75 basis point, which is nothing but 2.75%. So now the new rate is nothing but 2.75%. Right? 